Doug, tell us where the name of the mouse came from. Tell us the story of the naming of the mouse. That's a mystery. There were perhaps five or six people involved in, in getting it made and tested. Mm -hmm. And we go back and talk and no one can remember who, who first started calling it a mouse. I didn't. I don't think. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but it was perfectly obvious when the name came up that it was the right name? Sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> none of us apparently was a labeler, like I'm not a labeler. So I mean, we had to have a label. We had to have something to talk about. In the first report, we had to call it something. There was joystick, trackball, et cetera. Graphicon, you had to call it something. Okay. Brown box with button didn't work. <laughs> what was it, X, an XY position indicator or something? That, that, that didn't work. <laughs> short name. It had to be a short name, and it, it's, right. it's a very obvious short name. And, and Bill English, t tell, tell us about the competition. Um, there were a lot of competitors for the throne. What, what else was in the running? When you, when you, you know, well, talked a lot. There was one of the most common things at the time was a uh, light pen, and we got a light pen from the Sage system actually, and tried that out, and, and frankly didn't include it in the experiments because it was just so awkward to use. I mean, uh, the kind of thing we were doing with it was very different than what Sage did, mm -hmm. and the light pen was heavy, awkward to pick up, and by the time you got it picked up and in your hand and held it up there, you, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Light pen was one of the contenders. Uh, a joystick was a major one that was used for ages, from flying airplanes to everything. Was there one afternoon on which the, the first mouse worked? I sure. Tell us, tell us about I, the. Do you, were you there? You were. You, oh I mean, yeah, sure. It's the bit. I got it out of the shop and plugged it in. Do you and remember what you pointed at? Did you point and select on the very first day? <laughs> uh, yes, of course. <laughs> How else would it work? <laughs> I mean, we tested the analog circuits already, as, as we mentioned earlier. Uh -huh. These are analog potentiometers in here and uh, with a stop on them. So what you use is an AD converter. You transmit the analog signal back and interpret it in the computer, put up a digital, uh, put up the p place on the screen, the marker on the screen. Uh -huh. Was the very first use of the mouse for text editing? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. No, for testing. For testing. <laughs> but text selection yeah. was the first object, was actually being able to, I mean, the goal was we were working on text editing. The goal was a device that would be able to select characters and words. In fact, the, the tests that we ran in the uh, experiment was based on single characters and words okay. to get target size. Right. And so, no, you were asking about other yeah. devices. I quickly opened the, the light pen joystick were major ones. There were uh, trackballs were commonly used at the time. Did you compare to the comma command key, um, the command key sequence of moving uh, from letter to letter and word to word? We weren't experimenting with commands. It was only the selection. Okay. How, how you, the goal was to be able to point at something on the screen quickly. Did he mean the cursor stepping keys? Yeah, that's what I was thinking Oh, about. step keys. No, we didn't use <clears throat> step keys yeah. at all. No, that was... We didn't have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. that's very awkward. Yeah. Didn't use those. <clears throat> and for a long time, was there only one mouse? Well, uh, it wasn't very long before we started building the three button. I mean, obviously, very clearly, you needed more buttons. Yeah. It'd be useful to have. A person could manage more buttons easily. So Why, we... Mr. Jobs, how can you say that? <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the greatest mistakes in... Product history, I think. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but people ask me once in a while, how did you settle on three buttons? And I said, well, I, that's all we could get on. That's exactly right. There wasn't room for any more. <laughs> but anyway, so this, this just started out with an idea I'd sketched one time. And when we're setting up the tests, I thought, well, is there anything we're missing? Oh, I wonder if. So I got out those brief notes and gave them to him, and there's the result. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, now, were there skeptics in the group? Was it, was the, uh, you know, later on, much, much later on, the mouse became a religious issue. Remember, in the PC industry, there was a lot of opposition oh, yes, at first. of course, but that but, was much later. But so. in your group? It was a very small group at the time, and we were very open to experimenting with pointing devices. No one had a preconceived notion that this was it. In fact, for a while, we had one workstation, so when everybody sat down, they could use any of the devices yeah, they wanted to. Yeah, several devices. They could plug yeah. anyone in. And they, yeah. they, they all just, it just became the mouse was the only way that anybody chose after all. But there, there are very interesting things that went on, like uh, 
One of the devices actually, uh, when you move it around, actually had a slider out like this and when it rotated it worked one potentiometer and when it slid it worked another. So it gave the angle and how far away you were from the pedestal yeah. point. Radius and angle. It's thing so, called the graphicon. Right, so if you moved it in a straight line, it would go in an arc. <laughs> and so if you wanted to move in a straight line there, you had to make an arc. And people would be using it not even knowing you they were doing know. that. You would never they know. They would just go like this to move it straight across. It's very <laughs> easy to use. <laughs> even though you were following an arc with your hand, yeah. you could draw a nice straight line. Oh, that's great. That's great. And did you publish on the mouse at, at SRI and not until later at Xerox? No, oh mm -hmm. no, we did the, well, we published the mouse experiment. It was funded by NASA, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 64, we wrote a NASA report that compared the selection devices and that introduced the mouse. I've got, I've got a bulky set of the papers that you can look at. Mm -hmm. so there's and uh, that, you know, I, I think people read it and said, uh-huh. Yeah. You don't know of NASA trying to do anything no. application-wise? Mm -hmm. No. They were simply interested in command and control applications or? Well, it, I think it, they had different, different needs for a pointing device, really. Perhaps well, the reason we got that money was because Bob Taylor at that time was a psychologist in NASA right. headquarters. Right. And he was trying to sort of get into this kind of part of the world. So mm -hmm. he funded it through the NASA Langley Research Center. So mm -hmm. even the money came from headquarters down to them. Right. And uh, it was a little, it was in 1965 or 6 that we went down there to try to sell them on the time sharing. Oh, yes. But, uh, yeah. Very memorable event. <laughs> Now, at, at that point, the mouse was a, a way of controlling a cursor on, on, on the screen and selecting. Yes. Did you think about alternative technologies like voice? And, and were you thinking about other sort of... I don't think we considered voice at all. Voice, voice, that, that, voice didn't look like it was just over the horizon. Well, even if it were... Uh, even if it were, it wouldn't be useful. Yeah. I mean, it's it's sort of, once you think about what the task is, you can eliminate a lot of stuff that yeah. isn't going to work. Yeah. There were people like, like Licklider was sure that voice would just do away with a lot of this. Yeah. And I, I would try to tell him that, look, th in the future you're going to be moving through this knowledge space and it's going to be shaped much differently from it is now and you've got to go. And I said, sure, you can chunk along with voice recognition, like saying, get in your car and say, take me to the hardware store. Yeah. But, but in, in the really working like that, it's be more like you're skiing downhill through a lot of bumps like that. And I said, just picture yourself talking your skis down, a, down that kind of a route. See? <laughs> Not the right way to do it. Not right. the way to do it, no indeed. That, that you're going to be really totally involved. You've got so much marvelous sensory, perceptual, motor stuff that can learn to just go where you can see. But what, what's striking in what you're saying to me is that that early you had this notion or this vision of a three-dimensional space of information that you would be able to move through? At least three. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why right on from the beginning we made the hierarchical thing in there so that then all kinds of ways to move into that and with optional views. Yeah. And, and, and see, we just, I just can't imagine why people stuck. They got so proud in this someplace in the early 80s or something or 70s where you could do bitmap and uh, so then you could have on there what you're going to see when you print it out. And I'd say, okay, but actually printing it out is the last thing you want to do. <laughs> you know, it's when you're finally done. But, but gee, you're just missing a whole bunch of what else a computer can do for you. Well, that came pretty clearly in the JFCC presentation. And I wanted to go back to the JFCC to get a little bit of your sense of what you, were, you mentioned just previously that you really didn't have a sense of the audience response from where you were sitting. What were you thinking? while you were showing people? Um, just, just very glad that it wasn't breaking down <laughs> and yes. distracted because he, in sort of directing everybody to be ready for the cues, I could hear in my earpiece. So I had this, this thing of juggling that to know how soon somebody was going to get ready or if they weren't ready that I could go longer in one piece or something like that, but also keep speaking. And every once in a while I would make a, a verbal <laughs> faux pas. <laughs> <laughs> like what's an example? Well, like uh, the computer would be immediately responsible. Uh, responsive, I mean. See. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, maybe you could just sort of uh, 
Describe the whole, um, the whole FJCC setup, just the big components. I mean, there was a component down the peninsula, and then what were the... Well, the, big, the biggest component was the projector, of course. We had borrowed an IDA4 high resolution, high resolution for the time, 1024 line television. Our whole system was based on 1024 line television. And we had borrowed this IDA4 projector, which is a, a large projector that projects a very bright image. It has an arc light. And I won't go into how it does it, but we borrowed that, and it's, it's huge <laughs> uh, and very bright. And it's the only way we could project on a 32-foot screen across the top of the auditorium. That was a major piece of it. The other uh, pieces were getting the video from Menlo Park up, and I arranged with Pacific Bell to lease us two uh, radio links to carry video. Two, we always had a backup. We had doubled everything for backup, and we used both of them because as long as they were both up, we could use them. So we had uh, a video link, and we just connected that to our video display in Menlo Park and displayed on the Ida 4 projector uh, in the auditorium. And were you a director in the back of the building? I was in the back of the auditorium. Uh -huh. right. and, and he was also doing the video switching. We had a, a, a <clears throat> primitive video um, mixing device. We could do... Uh, horizontal and vertical cuts and fades, very primitive and simple at the time. And we did that, and that's how we did split screen with people in Menlo Park and people, and Doug. And did you have, while he was making the presentation, did you have a sense of the impact it was having on the audience? Did you get this sense of, you know? Well, I could see it. I could see people reacting to it, but uh, you know, that's tempered with the fact that I'm co really concentrating on making it work and coordinating the roles of various people. Uh -huh. So if it, I guess the director, if he's directing at the time, has a little trouble seeing the reaction. And but what I happened afterwards? It. What happened afterwards? Oh, everybody, you know, standing ovation. People went up to talk to Doug about it. People came back and talked to us on the platform about how did you do this? And great reactions at the time. Mm -hmm. There really had been nothing like it before. No. Nothing like that kind of presentation, what Doug was showing. I mean, there have been big video presentations before, but yeah. So. What we were showing. <laughs> I mean, there, there are people who argue, argue that that was the seminal moment in modern computing. I, I wouldn't dispute that. I think it really was, yeah. yeah that it really, people, basically people's minds were, were blown. Mm -hmm. I know people whose minds were blown. <laughs> I, know, I know people whose lives were changed by that demonstration, mm -hmm. uh, who had just never seen anything like it. Um, and were you nervous, Doug? Sure. <laughs> you know, it looked pretty calm to me. <laughs> well, there are little things like if something had crashed and had been a faux pas, uh, and somebody went and complained to ARPA about, hey, this mess coming up there like that, and ARPA would say, what presentation? <laughs> exactly. Because they, the guys there knew we were going to do it, but they only they they say, look. I can't authorize that. Just don't tell me. This was a bootleg operation. <laughs> ah, it really was. And whose idea was it to put on a uh, public? I'm sure it was Doug's. Yeah. You know, just let's see what we can do with this. He was invited to, to do a, a session, do a presentation at FJCC, and then so then we we just said, well, we've got video here and these things, and we had exposure to this Ida4 projector, which was a beautiful, beautiful phenomenon. A lot of way it worked. So we proposed it and. Um, then actually, a rare thing, they actually sent a site visit com committee down before they'd accept this proposal because mm -hmm. it was so unusual and they wanted to see that we could do it. Yes. And uh, one of the things we were challenged by is, is, hey, this doesn't sound so new. Somebody said they'd seen the same thing at NASA Langley. Uh -huh. Remember that? And I said, oh, well, that's our system running on us. Yes, it right? yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so you'd already had it up at NASA? Yeah. Not the projector, but the system. But the system. system yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because we had to go down a very interesting series of events that Bill, again, things we couldn't have done without him, but we wanted to get some movie pictures of this, an early stage of this editing and such as that. So we got a movie camera set up, a you know, movie camera, mm -hmm. and we put a shroud over the big display, and you had to get under there and work it like this <laughs> so they could capture that. And we went through a series of basic things about viewing and editing and jumping mm -hmm. like that. And um, so then there was an ARPA principal investigator meeting at in, in MIT a little bit later. And uh, 
a sort of a weird sort of circumstance is that Bob Taylor, who was the ARPA guy at the time, said, well, who's going to start? How about you, Doug? And I said, oh, well, I have a movie to show. Oh, well, great. So we projected the movie. And, uh, and that really laid... I had said several years earlier to an MIT group that, that uh, improving the speed of response is going to keep giving you value until you get diminishing returns maybe when you get below a quarter of a second response. And oh, everybody there was typewriter and everything like that. And that just, you could just feel the whole audience just turn disbelief or something like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this movie just showed them. Oh. Boom, boom, things were happening. It was very crude. So then later on, Bob Taylor said at a break, he says, well, Doug, uh, what was it? He says, I think the trouble with you is you don't think big enough. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, what would you really like to do? Oh, I said, we'd like to get a time-sharing computer. And we set up a lab where we could, a bunch of us could work on it simultaneously. And, well, okay, write a proposal. <laughs> and um, so then it turned out he had to, he, had, he, he again could do that through the, his old connections in ARPA uh, down at NASA. So mm -hmm. that he said, you'll have to go down and sell the guy who's head of information resources at NASA Langley, who was kind of an old line computer guy, et cetera. So Bill and Jeff Rulison and I went down there. And uh, that was a real critical time, mm -hmm. meeting those guys. Was so, it a hard sell? I, you know what better than I do. Well, I don't remember much detail about it. it was, because he was. Yeah, of course. Content, it, was, but, it was a hard start. But, but we but, got the money. Yeah, yeah. somehow we sold them. So earlier you mentioned, um, I know, you know the demonstration <coughs> included hypertext, and earlier you mentioned Ted Nelson. How did you meet Ted Nelson? Oh, he, had, he came out to see you, didn't he? Sometime was, I can't remember when it was, but... Uh, I remember the, uh, the Ted Nelson visit. I don't know when it was, but... Okay. What did, uh, Bill, what did you think of him when, when you first met A little met crazy. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, yeah, I was... A little extreme. And did all. he have the hypertext idea when he came out? Oh, he, yeah. Mm -hmm. He had that it was, independently, I'm yeah, sure. That was his, that's what brought him out. And did you have something to demonstrate to him at the point that he came out? Yeah, we we're certainly, sure. that, we were pretty far along. I think we had the 940s by the time he came out. Yeah. <clears throat> in fact, he went and sat down in Doug's office at his display with him. And you remember anything about the session? No. It was early on. Had he written Computer Lib by that point? This was after or before Computer Lib, do you remember? I don't remember. I don't either. Because yeah. many of the ideas filtered out that way mm -hmm. in terms of... But I, uh, you know, I just think he, he contributed a lot to getting people to talk about it, et cetera, and we have different ideas about how it would work, et cetera, you know, what details in there, but he's very creative. And, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> yeah. So we've been friends. We, I think we intend to stay friends, that sometimes people try to talk to us and get us polarized. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <clears throat> now, somebody also mentioned that at one point Arthur Clarke visited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> tell, tell us about Arthur's visit. Well, um, Elmer Shapiro's wife, uh, one of the guys who worked for us some part-time, was another part of SRI, his wife at one time had been uh, an assistant to Arthur. Uh, I guess in the East Coast or something like that. So he was touring and he wanted to do something in the Bay Area, so they were visiting together. And uh, Elmer brought them both into our lab. And it was kind of kick, so I'd read some of his stuff like that. And uh, so he looked around, and as he was leaving, he, it was about the only time I got to, close to him, and he said, gee, I write science fiction all the time. He says, but, but really, you got things here that, that are almost as unreal. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's, yeah. he says this is this is a this is a fix, this this is science future or something. Anyway, so yeah. that was a rewarding feeling. Yeah. Why don't we break at this point? And, I think and, you had to ask about oh. Home snake and his visit. Mother okay. Visit. Pardon? Do you remember that? Remember what? I mean, I've been aware of this. I used to eat lunch. Yeah. Can almost Every day. Dave, do you want some hand shots of the mouse? I was going to say, yeah. I would like just a repeat of one question and then hand shots of the mouse. It was the one where you asked how many buttons, and Doug responded by saying, 
You could only had three, but we needed more. And I, I was just in between a move. I'd like to just get that response. Do you want to take give <coughs> the mouse back? And then we'll get shots of the mouse. Then hold the mouse for right. Yeah. I'll ask a couple of questions and just let's chat about it again. But hold the. Um, yeah, and I think hold uh, Doug was holding it. Okay. You were holding it. Yeah. Oh, that's right. When you said that we only had room how for three. Many, how did you decide the right number of buttons? Well, uh, I thought I'd like a lot of them, but. I'll continue the snakes for you. Okay. He lunch with Ellen once a week. And his mother in law was coming to visit. And three weeks before she came, his pet snake disappeared into the plumbing system somewhere. The clear. And? Oh. oh, there was a saga of trying to catch the snake before his mother in law was very was, funny. Is this SRI? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How did you decide on the number of buttons to go on the mouse? Well, obviously, when you're testing it, all you had as a selector. And because of the position of the wheels, that looked like a reasonable place to put the button. But later on, we could think of more functions, so we started building them to work in the lab, our, our engineer creating them. And, and I would like lots of buttons, but we could only, I guess the limitation was how many that day. There was really technology. only room for three with the, with the buttons we had and the room yeah. for the wheel. We didn't want to expand the mouse too much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I've, I've got a strong feeling that, that people can use a lot of things. This is a case of function following form. <laughs> yeah. <And so laughs> That's some, right. Sometime we, uh, at the same time, we'd been experimenting with this cording key set. And so the two of them working together had a lot to do with how we built it. Why do you think the mouse gained acceptance, but the key cord didn't? I guess just a universal perception that that's very hard to learn. Yeah. Well, I have a, a little different perspective on that. I think the mouse added a real capability that everyone needed. What you do with the, the key set, and in fact what we did at Xerox and the, the first product was have c command buttons. They're not as flexible as the key set by any means, but you know that you could you could do things. We had a keyboard at SRI with it, delete word, delete, and all of those on the on buttons on the left side of the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So you can make up for some of the key set uh, need by buttons that are not as flexible. One of the big things about the key set is you could type on it, and you could type commands, limited typing for if you got fast. And, right. But you you could easily evolve a whole vocabulary of verbs and nouns, and the command recognition thing made it pretty efficient. Often one or two characters would flash up what you wanted. Yeah. So you start thinking about what you want to do in the terms of that, and the vocabulary would steadily grow. And uh, it was just as effortless to get those, and, and it was clear that the time it takes to go click on something, for like a menu, by the time you go click on something, you could be hitting with a key set three, four, mm -hmm. five characters. And, mm -hmm. and the selection was never worth that much information. Yeah. Plus, you had to do it after you selected what you were going to do like that. So yeah. the other way, you can be telling it what you want to do on the way. Mm -hmm. So when you get there, you're, it's, mm -hmm. it's doing in parallel and more efficiently. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the vocabulary, the growth of the verbs and nouns that you guys, mm -hmm. after you left, were just uh, a, a lot of them. Okay. So I, when I'm using some modern GUI things, I just would love to. Yes. And the interesting, interesting thing about that was three buttons were only the ones that were used. Yeah. And it turns out just ergonomically, using your thumb and your little finger. Now, where was that mouse used? It was on one of the terminals, or experimental terminals. Remember, it was a clear plastic mouse that had. At SRI? No, this is at Park. At Park. At SRI Park. I think Bowman developed it. And you had a. a That's a different subject I need to talk to you about, because I would really like to find that one. Doug, you were manipulating the mouse in your hand as you were describing it to. Uh, to us a minute ago. Can I just get you to do that as you were turning and you're, you moved it around so we could see different parts of it? What do you mean? Sort of the show and tell part of this. <laughs> I, th I remember that. Mouse. Bill Bowman did not remember that mouse. Really? I had a long talk with him well, about maybe it. Maybe he didn't build it then. Maybe he Herman he must not have built it because he didn't remember it. Could have been Herman Miller or somebody like that? I 
Wish I knew. I'd love to find it. But I remember the mouse. Very, that was the only one that used it. You remember using it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Do you have any idea where there's a picture of it? That would, that's an important I mouse. I could almost draw you a picture of it. it. It had spaces for all the fingers. That's right. Yeah, it was four yeah. fit, and there were these little, uh, you know, the little bars underneath each finger micro switches underneath. Yeah. That's the one I remember. And I haven't been, you're the only one I've. You want to have Doug just hold it? Run into who remembers that. That's interesting. You want it on the top side showing the button? Yeah, because I'm getting some reflections, so as you move it, it actually helps. I don't know where I could find any of those. Well, there was only one. There was only one, yes. There was only one. Exactly. It wasn't in connection with the wheel, though, because the wheel was the carved mahogany mouse, walnut.